So now let's talk about the places HIV is found. It's found in all the places that are listed here. It's found in the brain, which is bad news, because while HIV can cross the blood-brain barrier, the medicines that we give, the antiretrovirals, cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. It's also found in lymph glands. You have a kind of a subway system running through your body that moves the white blood cells around to, the, to places of infection. The subway stops, so to speak, are your lymph glands. And when you are facing infection, a lot of white blood cells will gather there so that they can then stage the fight against whatever the infection is. Think about when you were a kid and you told your mom that you didn't want to go to school because you had a sore throat. And she'd start jabbing you around underneath your jaw to see if you had swollen glands. Because if you did, what she knew was that you really did have a throat infection. But, but, the white blood cells were gathering at your lymph glands in order to fight the infection. You weren't just trying to get out of a social studies test. You, you really were sick. HIV targets CD4 cells. CD4 cells gather inside lymph glands. The two types of lymph glands that are most important in HIV transmission, well, in HIV, are the thyroid. That's where T cells are, are born and mature, and the gut lymph nodes. There are the gut lymph nodes seem to be particularly productive for use as HIV sort of proliferation and, and dissemination sites. HIV is also found in bone marrow, which is where B cells, the ones that make the antibodies, that's where they are mature. It's another place that HIV can hide, that, that the drugs can't get at it. And so if you, if you have HIV and you're on drugs but you stop taking them, then more HIV can seed out of the bone marrow and get the infection started up again. It's also found in the genital tract, and this is really important because it's the HIV in the genital tract that sloughs off into the semen in a man or sloughs off into the vaginal fluid in a woman that turns semen and vaginal fluid into infectious fluids. It's the HIV in the genital tract that does that. It's also found in breast milk, and it's found in blood. Well, okay, where isn't it found? HIV is not found on your skin. Free virus cannot exist on your skin. Um, it can't exist outside of blood. It's also infected CD4 cells, also not on your skin. So the outside of your skin, no problem. It's also not found in urine or in stool. Urine is actually a, a sterile fluid. And so unless there is blood present inside the urine or the stool, there's no chance of HIV transmission. And in, the ca in, in that case, what is the concern is the blood, not the urine or the stool. HIV is found in saliva and in tears, but at very, very, very low levels. Levels so low that there is not actually a transmission risk. The only way that you would have to be concerned about HIV transmission through saliva or tears is if you were talking about swimming pools full. Beyond that, like in the real world where we live, not a transmission risk. So, having talked about where HIV is and where it's not, how does that translate into how HIV is transmitted? We're going to be talking about these six ways, penal, vaginal sex, anal sex, oral sex, pregnancy and delivery, breastfeeding, and shared needles. I'm going to go through those one at a time and talk to you about the actual mechanics of transmission. And first, with, with penal vaginal sex, what we're talking about are cervixes and vaginas in women and penises in men. So for those of you who may never have had a sex, educa sex education class, or those of you for whom your sex education class was a long time ago, I'm going to start by showing a couple of schematics of the female and the male reproductive systems. If you find this disturbing, then you just fast forward in the lecture a little bit and you'll, and you'll be okay. Here's a schematic of the vagina and the cervix in the woman. There's where the vagina is. There's where the cervix is. This is a schematic of an uncircumcised penis. In this, you can see the foreskin. That's, in this drawing, it's a little white lining on the outside of the penis. That is uh, the piece of skin that is retracted during sex. You also can see the glands. That's the tip of the penis. And the metis, which is like the opening that goes up into your urethra. And inside the metis is a, is a mucosal surface, which means it can, be trans, it can be used as a portal for HIV 
into, the, into a man's body. Now we're going to be talking about penal vaginal sex. In the first case, I'm going to talk about a situation in which the man is infected and the woman is not. If the man is infected with HIV, the risk that, she, that the woman is facing is that his infected semen will come in contact with her vagina or her cervix. When that happens, there are three ways that HIV could end up crossing the barrier of her vagina or her cervix and getting to the target cells that it's trying to infect. The slide that I'm showing you, you'll see again when Dr. Hunter gives his talk, and you'll see more details about this, but let's just go over this kind of at a superficial level for a moment. The first way is that the virus can be captured by the dendritic cells within the mucosal tissue. Remember I was talking about dendritic cells as being like buses. They, their whole job is to cruise around right below the surface looking for germs that are trying to get in and grab those germs first and present them to the immune system so the immune system can get cranked up to do its job. Well, if the germ, if infected semen is up against the mucosal wall and there's a dendritic cell there, the dendritic cell will grab the HIV, pull it through the mucous membrane, and present it to a CD4 cell, which unfortunately is the target that the HIV was looking for in the first place. The second way is just, is just more direct. There's a tear in the vaginal wall, and HIV can just get right through that, right into the bloodstream where it can run across a dendritic cell or a macrophage or a CD4 cell. The third way would be if the woman had another infection, like a sexually transmitted infection, or she had a, a lesion of some sort or a cut that was full of, of white blood cells that were in the process of trying to heal that. Well, if there are a lot of white blood cells around, there are going to be CD4 cells, and HIV can just bump right up against one of its target cells. Boom. Infection. Okay, now let's flip it. What if it's an infected woman? Her risk in that case is that her infected vaginal fluid will come in contact with an uninfected partner's penis. As I mentioned before, the relative risk is different between uncircumcised men. And in an uncircumcised man, the outer foreskin and the glands, the tip, are not vulnerable because they're made of durable skin, but inside the foreskin, the part that gets retracted, the part that gets exposed when the foreskin is retracted, is just jam-packed with target cells for HIV. In fact, nine times as many target cells as you would find in a woman's cervix. If a man is circumcised, however, that shaft is no longer vulnerable because the skin on it becomes keratinized and becomes invulnerable to HIV, leaving only the metis as being the way that HIV can be transmitted, which is a much smaller target area. Okay, now let's look at anal sex. If the HIV-infected partner in anal sex is the insertive partner, or as, as we say, the top, in, then the risk is that the, that the man's infected semen will come in contact with the uninfected partner. It could be a man, could be a woman, with either his or her rectal mucosal tissue. And the problem is that rectal mucosal tissue is very fragile and it bleeds easily making a very easy way for HIV to get into the uninfected person's bloodstream. The other two ways are exactly as they are during penal vaginal sex. Dendritic cells present HIV to CD4 cells, or there are CD4 cells present at the mucosal area trying to heal up um, another infection that's going on or a lesion of some sort. Same way. If you reverse it, what happens if the HIV-infected person is the receptive partner or, or the bottom? In that case, the risk is that the infected blood, because as I said, the rectal mucosal tissue bleeds easily, if the infected blood comes in contact with the uninfected partner's penis. Same as before, the risk is higher for an uncircumcised man because the underlying the, the, the shaft of the penis, once the foreskin has been retracted, is very, very rich with target cells. Whereas in a circumcised man, the risk is less because the target area, just all that's left is the metis. Turning now, a third way, oral sex. In oral sex, the risk is that an infectious fluid, which could be semen, it could be vaginal fluid or it could be blood, including menstrual blood, will come in contact with some way in to the other person's body. Now, if you swallow the fluid, the semen, vaginal fluid, blood, 
that's fine because you're in your stomach the same digestive enzymes that you used to break down and digest your food are able to disable to inactivate HIV but if between your mouth and your stomach there is a way for HIV to cross over into your body it will take advantage of that way same way it's mucosal linings is, is there is there a, a is there a lesion that's full of white blood cells is there contact with a dendritic cell is there actually a tear a hole a cut that HIV can use to get directly into the bloodstream in all cases infectious fluid comes in contact with a target cell either directly or via a dendritic cell how about during pregnancy and delivery there are two place two stages in which a baby can become infected before it's born the first is during gestation while it's in utero the second is during labor and delivery in utero the risk is that the infection will somehow cross the placental barrier that mom's HIV will cross the placental barrier and infect the baby we don't actually know exactly how that happens the studies are still ongoing we based on a few small studies we think that actual infected CD4 cells are somehow or another crossing the barrier the that question is still open but what we do know what we're certain about is that the higher risk of infection occurs late in pregnancy that the longer a person is the the closer they are to being born the higher the chance that a baby will become infected in utero if they make it all the way through gestation without becoming infected they they risk HIV now during the process of being born the risk there is that the uninfected baby's mucous membranes will become in contact with the mom's infected blood this could be blood in her vagina I mean being born is bloody business the, the vaginal wall the tissues will tear and they'll bleed uh, once the amniotic sac the membrane has ruptured all of that amniotic fluid that the baby was floating around in which is a sterile fluid is not sterile anymore it becomes contaminated with all the blood that was in the vagina and in itself starts to because pose a transmission risk to the baby now talking about breastfeeding if the baby has gotten through pregnancy uninfected has gotten through labor and delivery uninfected the third chance can be through breastfeeding in breastfeeding the risk to the baby is multiple high volume exposures to low numbers of infected cells babies eat frequently and they drink a lot of milk which means that even though we know that breast milk does not carry a lot of infected cells or a lot of virus and in fact might have some protective value against HIV it's a numbers game you're just going to keep getting the baby just keeps getting exposed over and over and over every time it feeds and what we do know is that the longer a baby breastfeeds the higher the chances that it will eventually become infected again it's actually kind of a low probability event but it is not a zero probability event we know for a fact that we can lower the risk of transmission by giving mom and baby antiretrovirals during the breastfeeding period we'll be talking more about this during the biomedical prevention part of the course which is in week four when we give antiretrovirals to an infected mom we're using something that's called treatment as prevention we if we give her antiretrovirals and we're able to drive her viral load way down to the undetectable level then there's just going to be that much less virus for her to pass on through her breast milk to the baby therefore helping to prevent transmission to the baby by treating the mom if we give antiretrovirals to the baby we're doing something called prep or pre-exposure prophylaxis we are providing sort of an insurance policy a little extra help to keep the baby from becoming infected when it comes in contact with the virus through the breast milk you put those together you treat the mom you treat the baby and you can take breastfeeding uh, risk way way down last but not least definitely last but maybe most important is HIV transmission through shared needles or that's drug use in that case the risk is of direct bloodstream injection of infected blood from contaminated needles and syringes if you think about it a needle is a really good environment to keep HIV viable for a long time because the needle itself 
keeps uh, ultraviolet light from hitting the blood, keeps the air from drying out the blood, which means that the blood can stay viable, and if the blood is viable, HIV inside the blood is viable. So the hollow needles of syringes can keep HIV viable a lot longer than it would be if it was just like on a table surface or someplace like that. Also, uh, in the United States, there is a practice, in this country we call it backtracking, in which blood is drawn back up into the syringe after, as a part of injecting the drug. And that, that syringe that now has got blood in it is handed over to the next person for them to use when they inject the drug into them, which means that during backtracking, the other person is sort of getting a miniature transfusion of HIV-infected blood right into their bloodstream. This is a very high-risk activity with a very high possibility of HIV transmission. Okay, now we've covered all the ways, uh, sort of the mechanics of how HIV is transmitted. So now let's just talk about the mechanics of how it's not transmitted. Mosquitoes. Time alone has shown that mosquitoes don't transmit HIV because, you know, if they did transmit HIV, we would be finding a lot of people with HIV, a lot, a lot more than we already have now. We Kids, gardeners, farmers, they would all be considered very high risk groups for HIV, and, and they're not. But why is, why are they not? What's going on there? You know, people think, well, you know, mosquitoes will give you malaria, so why don't they give you HIV? Well, let me explain. Malaria is passed on by a parasite that, as part of its life cycle, lives in a mosquito's salivary glands. And when I say mosquito, what I'm really talking about is a female mosquito, because here's a, a factoid, is that only female mosquitoes bite. They use the blood that they, that they collect to help incubate their eggs. Well, if a, if a female mosquito has got the malaria parasite in her salivary glands, she injects that parasite along with some of her saliva into you as soon as she bites you because the saliva has an anticoagulant in it. The last thing that the mosquito wants is for your blood to plug up her nose. So she gives you a little anticoagulant before she starts sucking up your blood. When she does suck up your blood, it's going up through a completely separate tube into her stomach. So that little tiny mosquito nose has got two separate tubes in it and those, those are one-way streets. The saliva with the anticoagulant and if she's got malaria, the malaria parasite, down into you, the blood through a separate tube up from the mosquito into her stomach. So even if a mosquito were to bite a person with HIV, it's still just a one-way street. The blood that she collects from that person is going to go up through a tube into her stomach, then she's going to come land on you, bite you, and the blood from you is going to go up through that tube into her stomach. She is not pushing the blood that she had previously collected down into you. So mechanically, it's just not possible for a mosquito to transmit HIV, which explains what we have observed, which is that we don't see cases of HIV associated with mosquitoes. What about kissing? Kissing is a good thing. How would you get HIV through kissing? Well, it would take a set of circumstances like this. First, the person with HIV would have to have blood in their mouth because the saliva, like I said, can have, in some people with HIV, very, 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 very low levels of HIV in it, too low to transmit. So, if, but if there was blood and there was enough blood to overcome the diluting effects of all that saliva and that blood got into the other person's mouth somehow without them noticing, in enough quantity to overcome the diluting effects of their saliva, and that blood got into a cut or a lesion in the other person's mouth, then maybe HIV could be transmitted. So, you know, if you're kissing hard enough to break teeth, back off. You are kissing too hard. Other than that, you're fine. Saliva itself, 99% water. The rest of it is enzymes that break down the food that's trapped between your teeth to help protect your teeth from cavities. Also antibodies because you get a lot of germs in your mouth from stuff that you stick in your mouth, but not HIV in anything approaching a transmissible level. Hugging. 
Hugging, no risk for HIV. HIV does not live on the skin. Therefore, hug away. Hugging is great for the soul. Shared dishes, cutlery, not a problem. Yes, you should probably not share dishes and cutlery with a person because you could get a cold from them that way. You could get mononucleus that way. There's a number of things you can get, but you're not going to get HIV that way unless the dishes or the forks and knives have blood on them. So here's my advice to you. Don't eat off bloody forks. If you don't, you won't have to worry about HIV. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.